Hey, if you need any help on the other end, I'll manage. And we don't mind the overtime. Ain't no thing. Hey everybody and thank you for watching another video. My name is Merge and welcome to the Breaking Bad What If series that I call the Heisenverse. A series where I make a change somewhere in the Breaking Bad or Better Call Saul timeline and see how that one change ripples throughout the entire universe. And this video is all about Hank's barrel photo. It's like my barrel photo, huh? What would the series have been like if Walter just took a few more seconds to look at the photo and came to the realization on his own that there's no way in the world that Hank or Jesse could have ever found his money. But before we get started, if you could leave a like on this video to support the channel, I'd appreciate it. Now, let's get into it. Pay Huel and Kubi and take your cut. The rest is mine. Insurance in case I need you. Walter drives the van with the seven barrels of drug money out to the desert location. And while driving, he notices a business card from the rental company on the dashboard of the van. And maybe it's curiosity or flat out paranoia, but Walter is compelled to give the rental place a call and ask about any GPS features on their vehicles. And as he continues to drive, Walter breathes a sigh of relief knowing that the company used to have GPS up until six months ago, but they were sued by the ACLU and had to get rid of it. So after a few more minutes of driving, he makes it to a place that he hasn't been to in months, his first ever cook site, and he decides that this would be the place that he buries his money. So as he gets out the van, he listens to the howling wind for a moment before he opens up the back doors to grab a shovel and a pickaxe. And for the rest of the day, all the way into the late hours of the night, Walter digs and buries his life's work one barrel at a time. And once he memorized the coordinates, he heads back home knowing that he's the only person on earth that knows where his money is. Which leaves his only loose end to be Jesse. But when he finds out that he was caught up with the police for throwing his money out the window, this issue would need to be addressed quickly. So after making bail, they meet up in the desert and Walter was able to convince Jesse to leave town with the help of Saul's disappear. I set you up with a whole new life. So after a tear-filled hug, Walter and Jesse would go their separate ways for good, leaving his defense against Hank unimpeachable. But when Jesse finds out the truth about Walter having Hugh lift the rice and cigarette to help poison Brock, he abandons the idea of leaving town and vows to burn Walter to the ground. Literally. <laughs> But just as he's about to set Walter's house ablaze, Hank, who was following Jesse since he left Saul's office, intervenes. And with them now having a mutual enemy, they decide to work together to take down Walt. And at first, Hank plans to have Jesse booked with the APD, but knowing what happened with the nine guys Walter had killed in prison, he decides to instead take Jesse to his house and sober up and get a taped confession out of him. He was my teacher. But even with that confession and all that they know, without any solid evidence, they have nothing on Walter. But that all changes when Hank receives a voicemail on Jesse's phone from the man himself wanting to meet up and talk. And Jesse will be rightfully apprehensive about the whole thing, knowing exactly what Walter's capable of. But with Hank giving him no other choice, he puts a wire on him and he goes to meet up with Walter at the city plaza. But as Jesse gets closer, he starts to feel paranoid when he spots a guy in the area who looks suspicious. So instead, he runs over to a payphone and he warns Walter that he's coming from. Which leads Walter to prepare for this attack the only way he can. And he gives Todd a call saying, Todd. I think I might have another job for your uncle. We pick up with Walter meeting up with Jack and Todd to talk about the next job that he has for them. And when discussing payment, instead of wanting money, they want a couple cooks from Walter to help bring Todd's purity level up on his meth. And although officially retired, Walter begrudgingly agrees to give him one cook after the job is done. But now there's just a matter of finding Jesse. And at this point, Walter still has no clue that Jesse and Hank are working together. And currently, they're just finishing up with Huel getting the information about the barrels of money in the rental van. Me and QB rented a van for the dude, loaded his cash up in a self-storage unit, handed over the keys to him and Goodman, and who knows where he took it from there. So using this information to their advantage, Hank, Gomez, and Jesse would take a photo of some money on a black grill, making it look like it was found buried out in the desert. The next day over at the car wash, after Saul tells Walter that Hugh was missing, he stands waiting for the inevitable attack from Jesse. And as he looks out the window, Walter gets a text message photo that at first glance looked like his money was found. But upon further inspection, Walter notices some inconsistencies about the image, like the surrounding dirt. It looks more like Hank's backyard rather than the open desert. And as he continues to stare at the photo, he finally makes the connection that the reason why he was unable to find Jesse is because he's working together with Hank. And in mid-thought, Walter's phone begins to ring. And as he answers, Jesse says on the other line, Got my photo, bitch? But in this version, Walter's not going to be so erratic, especially since he called the rental place earlier and got the confirmation that there was no GPS. So knowing that it's not his money in the photo, and there's no way that anyone could have known where his money's buried, Walter figures that it's likely a setup, and he decides to act distressed to uncover what Jesse really wants, and he finds out that he supposedly found his money and wants him to meet up where it's buried, or else he's going to burn it all. And Walter switches over to a calm tone and takes control of the conversation, changing the subject to Brock, knowing that's why Jesse's really upset. And he'd purposely be vague, just saying, Jesse, please, I know that you're angry about Brock, and I'm sorry about what happened to him, but burning money isn't going to change how you feel. 
Well, I'll tell you what I'm going to feel, bitch. Nothing but the heat from a bonfire if you're not here in 15 minutes, Jesse says in a threatening tone. And Walter, knowing that he's at least four moves ahead of Jesse, calls his bluff and tells him, Do what you have to do. But just for future reference, tell Hank, next time, try using something other than our old family grill. And he hangs up the phone. But this new revelation puts him at a bit of a crossroads, because knowing where Jesse is, he can just simply call Jack and have him taken care of. But the only problem with that is that although he's not seeing eye to eye with Hank, the last thing he wants to do is put him in the crossfire between Jack and Jesse, so he holds off on giving the order for now. He instead calls Saul informing him that the DEA has Huel and Jesse and Hank are working together, and once Saul was all caught up, he advises Walter saying, You know, that brother-in-law of yours is some piece of work, I tell you, but I'll deal with that later. But in the meantime, we can assume that Jesse spilled his guts to Schrader, so if he's not in the system by now, he will be. And Walter questions, and how do you know that? Because when I get down to the DEA, I'm getting Huel, and I'm going to let them know that one or more of their special agents are illegally holding clients under false pretenses, and not to mention they're harboring a drug dealing murder. No offense, Saul says jokingly. But seriously, Walt, once I do this, you better get yourself ready for the shitstorm that's to come. And Walter ends the call saying, I'm ready. We pick up with Hank and Gomez who's watching Jesse talk on the phone and he says, Hello? Hello? Mr. White? Ah, damn it, yo! Jesse says throwing the Hello Kitty phone. And the two officers look at each other with Hank speaking up saying, I take it that's not good news? And Jesse says now sitting at the table with him, Mr. White knows. He, he knows everything. And Gomez chimes in saying, what do you mean he knows everything? He said, tell Hank next time don't use your family grill. Jesse says in a matter of fact tone. And the room grows silent between the three, mainly because that was their only lead. And now without the element of surprise, they have nothing. And Hank takes his frustration out on Jesse saying, if you would have just sat down with the man, we could have had him by now. And Jesse responds defensively saying, hey man, let's not pretend that we're buddies here. I know if I would have sat down with Mr. White and something would have happened to me, you wouldn't have cared. And don't think that I didn't hear you guys the other day. Hankman gets killed. We get it all on tape. And with Jesse basically on the verge of shutting down after a heated back and forth between him and Hank, Gomez pulls him to the side and says, I know this might be career suicide, but I think it's time to turn the kid over. You know I got your back, brother. But the longer you hold on to him, the more it puts you at risk. And I know you don't want to end up like Marquette. Yeah, you're probably right, Gomi. Maybe the best case scenario was to get him in the system. And who knows, maybe with Walt's ties to this white power prison gang, that could be our last shot at getting the bastard. And Gomez looks at Hank with a look of uncertainty, but ultimately goes along with his plan. And the two agents approach Jesse with Hank telling him holding a pair of handcuffs. Alright, Pinkman, it's time. And Jesse stands with visible fear on his face knowing exactly what this could mean for him. Because he knows that his partnership with Hank was going to land him behind bars eventually. But he hoped that he could take down Walter before that would have happened. But now, the retired drug kingpin is basically untouchable at this point. And with nothing to threaten him with, the trio of Jesse, Hank, and Gomez drives down to the station to have Jesse booked and put in the system. We pick up at a bus station parking lot with Saul and Huel going over their exit strategy. With Saul telling him, I'm sorry I got you wrapped up into this Huel. You gonna be alright from here? Saul finishes handing him some money. And Huel tells him while taking the cash, Yeah, I'll be alright. I'm headed back to Louisiana. But what about you? What you gonna do, man? Hey, hey, don't worry about me. My lifeboat's coming within the hour, because things on this side of town are about to go nuclear. He says referring to Jesse and Walter's situation, and as he extends his hand to Huel, he tells him, But hey, it's been quite a ride, my friend. Take care of yourself, and have a nice life. And the two shake hands before going their separate ways, and Huel gets out the car and heads over to the nearest bus. And as Saul pulls away, he receives a phone call from Walter, no doubt seeking more legal counsel. But Saul's no dummy. He knows that if push came to shove, Walter's going to take anyone he can down with him. And considering what happened with Mike and now Jesse, he doesn't want to be third on the chopping block. And with the DEA involved, time is now of the essence. So instead of answering, he let the phone ring and with a different phone, he'd call Francesca. Hey, Francesca, I'm so happy I caught you. Are you still at the office? Yeah, but I'm, yeah, but I'm literally walking out the door. What do you want? Francesca says, has the cops of the maestro been by yet? Saul questions. No, just the usual scum of the city. Francesca responds. Okay, great. Whew, that's, that's good news. And also, um, I want to be indisposed for a few weeks or months, so you may want to think about getting another job. But the response he gets from Francesca is just her hanging up in his ear. Hello? Hello? And as he continues to drive until he makes it back into his office, the entire time Walter would be calling his phone back to back. And regardless of the threatening voicemails, Saul just wouldn't answer. And once he got his bags packed, he'd make one last phone call to Saul Goodman. I need a new dust filter for my Hoover Max Extract Pressure Pro Model 60. Can you help me with that? 
We pick up later that same day in the evening with Walter, Skylar, and Walter Jr. who just finished having dinner. And while Skylar and Walter Jr. are cleaning up the kitchen, Walter's in the bathroom in full panic mode calling Saul over and over to get an update. And not hearing from him since finding out about Huel, he gets paranoid thinking that the DEA has gotten to him too. But when Skylar knocks on the door, she asks, Is everything okay, Walt? Breaking him from his train of thought. And he responds saying, Yeah, honey, I'll, I'll be out in a minute. And as soon as he turns on the sink to wash his hands, he feels that he's about to vomit and he rushes over to the toilet just barely making it. And knowing that his cancer is back and only seems to be getting worse, there's a feeling of calm that washes over him. Because he knows that the clock is ticking and even if Hank and Jesse was to find some shred of evidence, by the time that would happen, he'd already be dead and buried by then. So when he gets out the bathroom, Walter Jr. asks, Are, are you okay, Dad? And Walter responds with a half smile saying, Never better, son. The next day rolls around and we pick up in an interrogation room with Hank Schrader, Steve Gomez, and Jesse Pinkman, and a few other officers from Internal Affairs. And even after reviewing the confession tape and getting their statements, there's more questions being raised about Hank's judgment or lack thereof when it comes to the Heisenberg case. Because what are the chances that the brother-in-law to a veteran DEA agent was the same drug kingpin that he was chasing for nearly a year and a half? And not only that, but the man that he nearly beat to death in his own home is the only witness he has to attest to these accusations. And who's to say that Hank didn't force Jesse to make the confession tape given that it wasn't made in an official capacity? And those are just a few of the questions raised about this unlikely partnership of theirs. But given the evidence gathered, Jesse would be booked and held in protective custody. And the only reason why Hank isn't sharing a cell with him is because his reputation and the confession might lead to further arrests like with Todd or Walter, if he's right. So for the time being, Hank is placed on leave while internal affairs and APD conduct their investigations. And before Jesse's taken away by the officers, Hank tells him, Jesse, you're gonna be okay. Trust me, nobody's getting to you. And Jesse doesn't say a word, he just looks at Hank with a half smile before he's taken out the room. And once Hank turns over his gun and badge, he has a one-on-one -on -one video conference with his boss who tells him, Hank, I'm in your corner here, but I have to tell you, this is a lose-lose situation for you. And we're not even going to talk about you holding Babineau. But all I'm going to tell you is this. I hope you're right. And if there is a next time, please do it by the book. And Hank responds saying, yes, sir. As he leaves the building, no longer a special agent, but now just a civilian. A few days later, the moment that Walter knew would come has finally arrived, and that's when the police come knocking at his door, and him and Skyler would be called down to the police station to answer some questions. But seemingly with nothing to hide, they would go willingly. And we all know how Skyler can craft the perfect alibi, even down to crying on cue. Maybe I'll tear up a little. I don't know. So after all the questioning, the police end up with nothing, but they basically hint that Jesse's already in custody. So once they finish up at the police station, Walter and Skyler heads back home, and while driving, Skyler asks, So, um... What do you think our next move should be? And Walter is slow to respond, looking at Skyler, then back at the road. Once Jesse Pinkman is out the picture, it'll all be over. And, and what about Hank? You know he's not just gonna stop. Skyler questions. Well, right now, Skyler, Hank's on leave, so it doesn't really matter what he says. And don't worry, I got it under control. Walter says arrogantly as he pulls into the driveway, and he tells Skyler to go inside while he makes a phone call, and he reaches out to Todd and tells him, Todd, Jesse's in custody. I don't care how your uncle does it, but I need him gone immediately. And Todd says, okay, we'll get right on it, Mr. White. And Todd, you might want to lay low for a while. Jesse told the DEA everything, including what happened with the boy. Walter explains, okay, thanks for the heads up, Mr. White. And we'll call you when the job's finished. Todd says, ending the call. We pick up a few days later inside Jesse's prison cell, and during the late hours of the night, although in protective custody, sometimes cameras don't work like they're supposed to. And this night, the wing that Jesse's held in is having major systems issues, which creates a kind of blind spot in the area. And while Jesse's sleeping, his cell door opens and he quickly awakens to a prison guard standing in the entrance. And Jesse says, Hey yo, what's, what's going on? But the guard remains silent as two inmates walk into the cell holding shanks, both with swastika tattoos on their necks. And Jesse sits up in his bed with his back against the wall as he yells out for help. But sadly, nobody's coming to his rescue. And as the inmates approach Jesse, the guard watches on as he's stabbed repeatedly, turning his screams for help into blood-curdling gas for air. And by the time that they're done, Jesse will be completely unrecognizable, covered head to toe in stab wounds. The next day rolls around and Walter receives a phone call from Todd saying, Hey Mr. White, we, um, we did that job like you said, but things did get a little messy. Sorry about that. That's, that's alright, Todd. Has the police come by to talk to you at all? Walter questions. No, sir, Todd answers. Good, good. Now about the cook, I can maybe come over later this evening to show you the steps. Yeah, that works for me. Just call before you come. Todd says ending the call. And once off the phone, Walter begins to think of Jesse, and he imagines what his last moments were like. And when the guilt starts creeping up on Walter, no matter how many times he tries to convince himself that he had to do what he had to do, it doesn't make him feel any better. 
So as he heads to the bathroom to take a shower, he starts to feel a little lightheaded, but he shakes it off. And as he gets undressed, the feeling comes back harder this time. And before he knows it, everything goes black for Walter as he passes out on the bathroom floor. And in most cases, Skylar or Walter Jr. would be there to check and see if he's alright. But at the moment, Walter's home alone. And when the news of Jesse's murder makes the headlines, the police once again are knocking at his door. But this time, there's no answer. And minutes later, Skylar and Walter Jr. would arrive being confused to see so many cops at their house. And once she gets inside, Skylar calls out for Walter and the police enter behind her searching the room for him. But when checking the master bathroom, Skylar screams out Walter's name in distress when she sees him laid out on the bathroom floor. But when she taps him on the arm, he regains consciousness opening his eyes to Skylar in a room full of police surrounding him. And after turning the police away and demanding a lawyer before speaking to them again, Walter's taken to a hospital for an evaluation. And right now the police still have no solid evidence, so they have no choice but to back off. But the person who has plenty of questions about what's going on is Walter Jr. And once inside the hospital room, he asks, Mom, what, what the hell's going on? Why were the police at our house? Flynn, now's not really the best time to talk about this, Skyler says. Well, it's either you tell me what's going on or, or, or I'm going to ask the police myself or Uncle Hank. And Walter speaks up from the hospital bed telling him, Son, this has to do with me gambling. What? But, but, but I thought you weren't doing that anymore. I'm not, son. I'm done with that. But the people who I dealt with when I was gambling was connected to some dangerous people. People like Gus Fring. And now the police, including your Uncle Hank, think that I'm somehow a part of some drug empire. I'm sorry I didn't tell you sooner, son. It's just with my cancer getting worse, I didn't want you or your mother to worry. Walter explains getting emotional as he pulls them both in for a hug, with Skylar giving him an annoying look but goes along with the same story that she created for them to tell the police just days ago. We pick up with Hank who just received a visit from Gomez and the two talk about what happened with Jesse, with Steve saying, so do you think the whole sacrificial lamb thing with Pinkman is going to turn any heads at Walter? And Hank who's feeling a little guilty about what happened to Jesse just tells him, if it doesn't, I got one more avenue I didn't try yet, Gomi. Hank says flipping through papers. Remember Pinkman said that the kid Drew Sharp was killed by this Todd Alquest and- And you're thinking what? Some other off the book assignment that's going to dig you deeper in the hole that you're already in? Gomez says cutting off Hank. I know you want to fight the good fight, brother, but look what it's cost you. I think at this point, you might as well let Eternal Affairs look into it. And Hank looks at Gomez with frustration in his face before he says angrily. I don't give a rat's ass what it costs. What else can I lose? Hank says standing up. So let me tell you something, if you're not going to help me, the door is right there. And do yourself a favor, if you leave, don't come back, brother. And Gomez stands in disbelief at what he was just told by the man he considered a brother. But with no interest in helping him fight a losing battle, Gomez leaves the house and he heads back to El Paso. And as for Hank, he gathers what he can about Todd and decides to go out on his own and do some old fashioned detective work. So for the next few days, even weeks, Hank follows Todd to see if he can find some answers that internal affairs can't. Picking back up at the hospital, Walter's cancer continues to worsen, causing him to be bedbound for nearly two weeks. And during this time, he puts together a contingency plan for his untimely demise, starting with Todd. Because right now he can barely stand, let alone cook a batch, leaving his only option to be paying him off. And then there's Hank, who has not let up for a second since finding out. And although his plan backfired with him being put on leave and under investigation as well, Walter comes up with a plan to not really kill two birds with one stone, but rather clip their wings. So as far as metaphors go, in this case, the stone or wing clipper is going to be the confession tape, which will absolutely take all the eyes from Walter and his family and see them more as victims as opposed to suspects. This is my and with everything that Hank's been doing lately, from illegally detaining Huel, partnering with Jesse, and now him wanting to look into Todd while being under investigation, the tape would make his actions make sense. And with his hospital bills being paid by Walter, that would be the only evidence that cannot be refuted. Meanwhile, over with Todd, for the past few days he's been tailed by Hank, but hasn't come across any illegal activity, mainly because Lydia is not interested in his meth, and since Walter hasn't taught him yet, he hasn't been cooking. And Hank's obsession with finding some evidence has him either watching Todd's apartment or outside Jack's compound. And for the past few weeks, he's practically been living inside his car, but he's not exactly blending in. And his presence gets Todd's attention seeing Hank's car parked near the fence just outside the property. But being that it's an unmarked car, it looks more like a rival gang scoping out the place. And inside the clubhouse, the gang is getting ready for war, strapping on vests and loading up guns, all while Hank watches through his mirror, unknown of the impending danger that he's about to face. And as soon as the gang is about to step out guns blazing, Hank decides that he's overdue for a shower and decides to head home. But as he makes his way back into town, he'd be followed by a black and red El Camino that's not too far behind. And when he makes it home, the tables have turned with Todd now staking out Hank's place. And while Hank is inside taking a shower, Marie asks him, Are you going to stay longer than 20 minutes this time? Jesus, Marie, you know what I'm trying to do. Just, just let me do it. I know, I just, it's just, I, I, I just miss you. Maybe you can take the night off one night just for me? 
Marie questions, and as the shower runs for a moment, Hank takes a deep sigh and says, Okay, baby, I'll take the night off, but first thing in the morning, I'm back at it. Now, come here, you. Hank says, pulling Marie into the shower, and the two enjoy each other for the first time in months. But in the late hours of the night, Hank and Marie lie in bed sleeping, but when the sound of broken glass can be heard, Hank gets up and he quickly grabs his personal gun from his drawer and walks out towards the noise. And while he slowly walks through the house, he hears the noise coming from his garage. But before he can even open the door, he's hit with a barrage of bullets from Jack and his crew from inside the garage that drops him instantly. And the sound definitely wakes up Marie, but the first thing that she sees is Todd with a mask on holding a gun to her face. And he just says, I'm sorry ma'am, and pulls the trigger. The next day passes and the news of Hank and Marie being killed during a home invasion is the topic of discussion for everybody in the city of Albuquerque. And when the news makes it to Walter, he's both saddened and relieved that Hank is no longer an issue. And he'd never made the connection that it was actually Jack and his crew that killed Hank and Marie, leaving his last piece of business to just paying off Todd. And being that the car wash is basically self-sustaining, the money can just be taken from there. So Walter makes a call to Todd on the hospital phone and he tells him, Todd, it's Walt. I don't want you to think that I've been dodging you. It's just... I have cancer, and it's only beginning worse. Oh, Mr. White, I'm, I'm sorry. I had no idea you had cancer. Is there something I can do? Todd says genuinely, that's okay, Todd. But the reason I'm calling is because I'm not able to give you the cook. It has to be cash, but I'll double it for the inconvenience. Walter explains, I understand, Mr. White. Cash will work. Just, just say where, Todd says. I'll give you a location in a few hours. And Todd, thank you. And as Walter hangs up the phone, he takes a deep breath and smiles, and this is the best he's felt in a really long time. But all of a sudden, he becomes overwhelmed with a feeling of exhaustion, and he holds off on calling Skylar to rest for a bit. But as his eyes close, the heart rate monitor that he's attached to gets slower and slower, until he eventually flatlines. Months later, after all the funerals and investigation, one night while Skylar and Walter Jr. are home, she goes to check on Holly who's crying in the room. And when she gets there, she sees three men in masks waiting for her. And before she can scream, one of the men cover her mouth as the others approach. We then cut over to an exterior shot of the white residence, and there will be a faint sound of two suppressed gunshots going off inside the house. And as the men get back to their car, one of their phone rings to a familiar ringtone. And when the call is answered, Lydia asks, Is it done? Are they gone? And the man takes off his mask, revealing that it was Todd, and he tells her, Yes, ma'am. It's done. Oh, thank goodness, Lydia says, breathing a sigh of relief before continuing. Tomorrow, we'll meet up at our usual spot, and I'll give you the money Walter owed you, as well as the payment for this job. Okay, Miss Quell, I'll see you then. Todd says before Lydia hangs up, and the crew heads back home. And once they leave, we focus back in on the exterior shot of the white residence, and as things fade out, we hear the sound of a crying baby that's still inside the house. Hey everybody and thank you so much for watching another video and I really hope you enjoyed another story from the Heisenverse. And I know what this one the most asked question about this story is going to be, what's going to happen with Walt's money? And to that my answer is simply, it's still out there, but I doubt that anyone will ever figure out what to do with the lottery ticket. But with this story I wanted to tie up all the loose ends and show what it's like when the bad guy wins. Because seriously, who's rooting for Todd or Lydia? And even after their partnership I doubt they would even continue doing business together because who's going to teach Todd how to cook? But that's just me. But now I want to hear from you guys. What do you think of this Breaking Bad story? Did you like it? Did you hate it? Do you think there was something missing? Whatever it is, let me know down below in the comments and I'll do my best to respond. But until then, my name is Merge. Later.